Well, good morning to all of you. Thanks so much for having me again this day on this cold, snowy day in the middle of Greek class. May I be a uh, little refreshment to you, huh? If I would have known, we could have done something in the New Testament. You could have opened up your Greek Bible and we could have gone together through the word, but but I, I didn't know that or I forgot that or something, but we're in the book of Psalms this morning. So take your Bible and go to Psalm 18, Psalm 18 for our time together in the word of God. I'm so thankful for Brooks Bible College and and uh, President Thurman and the faculty and administration and the board and, of course, all of you as students. It's just a joy for me to be here with you and to, to point you again to the word, to remind you of the truth that you know. Uh, but let's, let's pray, and then we'll jump into Psalm 18 together. Let's pray. Great God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can open up the word of the living God, the truth of Scripture. Lord, that we can be reminded that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So please equip us, even in this hour, for every good work. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 18, I want to direct our attention to verses 20 to 24, and really I want to bring you a message that I have titled, Live with Integrity. Live with Integrity. You know as well as I do that integrity is hard to find nowadays, but if there's anything that God wants in your life, if there's anything that God wants in my life, it is that we would be men and women of integrity. Steve Lawson called this personal integrity so important by saying personal integrity is fast becoming an endangered species in our time. Today in our culture, you know this, let me just remind you very briefly, we in our culture are producing corrupt people who are skilled at lying. We are applauded when cheating in our culture. We are tolerated when falsifying. We're permitted when stealing. It is accepted when we are distorting. And we are just publicized when covering up the truth. It's like we're applauded and we're celebrated for all of the sins that have just been mentioned. But yet, you know, we must be people of integrity. We must be men and women of integrity and That means we must be pursuers of personal holiness. If you are to live a life of integrity before God, you need to live a life of personal, private holiness before the Lord. I think think holiness and integrity are like are like two wheels on a bicycle that they must go together. You can't have one without the other. If we want to be a man or a woman of integrity, we have to be a man or a woman of personal holiness as well. Really, to kind of set the stage, can I just ask you a couple of questions, just to kind of probe your heart a little bit and, and uh, to get you thinking a little bit. Consider your life. Are you the same person on the inside that you are as you present yourself on the outside? Do you conduct yourself and live a life of sincerity? And that is to say, if your life was kind of brought to the sunlight of the word of God, would you be stamped as being a person without any crack? You're blameless, you're true, you're full of truth. Or would the light of God's own face reveal the the cracks in our character and the, the areas where there are inconsistencies in your life? Or maybe to think of it like this, do you live repudiating, that is rejecting fleshly wisdom in worldly ways, or it's very easy to be motivated by jealousy, to be motivated by envy, selfish ambition that that kind of causes a person to take advantage of people to get what I want, to have power and control over people in whatever 
place God may have put you in life. I think if you're to live a life of integrity, it will be costly to you. Kind of like Amos. I, I love the book of Amos. I love the man Amos. I, I just love the, the character of this guy, this, this man who wasn't even, you know, you know, a preacher by trade, as it were. He just said, I'm a, uh, I'm a sycamore fig tree grower, right? I'm just a sheep herder. But God has called me to be a preacher. And he wrote in Amos 5 and verse 10 that the unbelievers abhor the one who speaks with integrity. That's just the way our culture is. If you're going to speak truth, if you're going to live a life of integrity, just count on it. You're going to be abhorred by the world. You're going to be rejected by the world. But J.C. Ryle gives a good word. He said, there can be no holiness without a warfare. There can be no holiness without a warfare. And I think really kind of a, in a spiritual sense, that certainly is true. But for David, even physically, it was true as well. Already anointed as the king, and yet on the run for his life from Saul. You know the story in those chapters. In 1 Samuel, he was already anointed by the prophet Samuel to be king. And, and yet Saul and his envy and his jealousy, Saul was running after and pursuing and wanting to kill David, the young anointed king. Well, Psalm 18, look in the title of your psalm. It's a psalm of David, and he calls himself the servant of the Lord. And then he gives really kind of a long, kind of a historical introduction, kind of a superscript, we call it. And he says that he spoke to the Lord the words of the song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of, of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So here's a song of victory from warfare physically. But David's heart certainly was right. He was a man who spiritually wanted holiness. He fought the spiritual war as he was battling the physical battles as well. Psalm 18, you look in your Bible and you think, man, this is 50 verses. Are you going you're gonna to teach on the whole thing? No, no, no. We're not going to teach on the whole thing. But this is a song of deliverance. God has delivered David in this psalm, and he delivered him from all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul, and it probably was written early in his reign. It probably was written early on because Saul is mentioned here in the introduction, and what is really fascinating is 2 Samuel chapter 22 is nearly verbatim to this whole chapter. 50 verses, nearly verbatim, are also found in the historical book of 2 Samuel chapter 22. I would like to encourage you to consider reading this chapter at a later time, just in your own morning prayer time. Just kind of reading through the psalm with an eye toward the attributes of God. As you're looking for the attributes of God, as David is going to remember God, he's going to extol God, he's going to worship God, because what I want you to remember as we begin is a right understanding of God will motivate godly living before the face of God. A right understanding of God will motivate right living before the face of God. But it's very easy to forget that, isn't it? We've seen, it's like week after, it's like day by day or week by week or month by month. It's like people are falling and people are being disqualified. And we hear stories and we hear all this. And what I want to remind you is it doesn't begin with just a moment. It begins in the heart. It begins in the heart of being intimate with the Lord and communing with God and having a right understanding of God that motivates right living before the face of God. Now, Psalm 18 is big. I want to show you kind of the big picture, and then we're going to zoom in and look at a little bit together. The beginning of the psalm and the end of the psalm are all about praise, praising God, verses 1 to 3 and 46 to 50, praising God, praising God, beginning and end. And then you have a long section on remembering God, all that God has done and how God has delivered and how God has brought salvation and how God has rescued David. 
praising God, remembering God, and then remembering God, praising God. That's kind of the structure. Praise, remember, and then remember, praise. But right in the middle of all of that is a really short little five verse section. It's like, it's like the mountain peak. It's like the climactic part of the whole psalm. It's like the emphasized part of the psalm. And it's in verses 20 to 24. And guess what? It's all about David's personal integrity. I want to read that. And I want to focus on that with you. So follow with me. Psalm 18, verse 20. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless with him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyes. You see the theme of integrity kind of in a number of different ways. Notice in verse 20, he talks about integrity with the phrase that God has rewarded me according to my righteousness. The same thing in verse 24, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness. But look though, at the beginning of verse 23, I was also blameless, blameless. Now the King James Version has upright. Another English translation has faultless. Another English translation has single-hearted. And of course, the ESV and NIV and NASB have blameless. I, I've been blameless with God. Now look at verse 23. Right now in your life, could you make David's words your own? In verse 23, I am walking blamelessly with God. What does that mean? mean the idea in the hebrew language of walking in blamelessness has to refer to a wholehearted commitment to the lord a wholehearted commitment to the lord and his requirements it it means there's no compromising at all the the, the fundamental idea of the hebrew verb complete or blameless has to do with that which is ethically sound, that which is upright, that which is whole, complete, well-rounded. We're not talking perfectionism here. We're not talking that you're sinless here. That's not the point. The Bible does not teach that. The idea of being blameless is this idea of being balanced in life, well-rooted in God, walking in integrity. Noah was a blameless man, Genesis 6. Job was a blameless man, Job 1, verse 1. What does it mean, verse 23, I was blameless with God? David is saying, I have a wholehearted commitment to the person of God and the requirements that God has put upon me. And, and just to, to let you know that, that this is for, for all of us. Whether Titus chapter 1, for somebody who's a pastor or an elder, it's a requirement for leadership that he must be above reproach. He must be a, a one-woman man, above reproach in the marriage, above reproach in his home, above reproach in his heart and above reproach in how he handles the word. But for every believer, for every single one of us, Second Peter chapter three, Peter says we ought to strive to be found blameless before the Lord. That's, that's for all of us, Second Peter 3, 14, to be found blameless. You say, Jeff, I, I get it. I see the need. I, I see it in the, in the kind of the Christian evangelical world. I see it on the headlines. I see the need. I, I hear the stories. I read about all of this in verses 20 to 24. Tell me how. How can I live a life of integrity? I want to give you three 
simple resolutions. And what I'm going to give you are real simple first person singular, you get that, first person singular statements. These are like personal declarations. I will, I resolve, I must, I want to do three things to live a life of integrity. And this is David right here, kind of modeling this. Number one, the first way to do this is to have this resolution. Number one, I keep the ways of God. I keep the ways of God. And verse 21 is going to sort of zoom in, not to your conduct so much as it is to your heart. Verse 21 is like an arrow that's going through the skin, through the surface level, and it's penetrating the heart. Look at verse 21. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and I have not wickedly departed from my God. I've kept. I've kept, I've watched over. We all keep things that we love. We all pursue things that we love. Our heart chases after things that we love. And David says in verse 21, I have kept the ways of God. This is integrity. It begins in the heart. It begins with keeping the ways and the truth of God. It's like following after the Lord with all of our hearts. It's like people that are traveling and they're following their tour guide and they're keeping the path of the tour guide. It's like, it's like a child who's gonna keep the path that the parent sets before him. He's gonna follow the path that David is saying right here, I keep the ways of God. Could that be said of you? In verse 21, I, I keep the ways of the Lord. I keep the ways of God. And the, the flip of that is I have not wickedly departed from my God. Now, take your Bible and keep your finger here, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Joshua already read this at the beginning, but let me show you where it all begins. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, I think it just is a, such a good fit for this res resolve, I will keep the ways of God. Look at how Paul describes Christian ministry, not, not just for a pastor, not just for a missionary, but for every single person who's serving the Lord in Christian ministry. Verse one, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, verse two, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. What does that mean? I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to walk in craftiness, verse two. I'm not gonna adulterate the word of God, but by manifestation of the truth, I'm gonna commend myself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul says, I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. I'm, I'm keeping the ways of God. And, and you, can, you can look at my life. You can look into my heart. My conscience bears me witness that I have kept the ways of God. I've not adulterated the word. I've not lived life in Christian ministry for false reasons or false motives. But I live a life of integrity. Really, I think what David is getting at, back to Psalm 18, is you live a life for God even when no one is looking. You live a life for the Lord when no one is looking. So when you're, when you're driving, when you're in the privacy of your home, when you're scrolling through the phone or the websites, or you have just that free time and no one, no one is watching or looking or peering over your shoulder, what do we spend our time doing? What is it that our hearts are chasing after? I pray that it would be for me and for you and for all of us that we would say with David, I have kept the ways of the Lord. Whether people are watching or whether people aren't watching, whether, whether people are gonna ask me about it or not, that I would keep the ways of God. Integrity a life of completeness, a life of wholeness begins, first of all, with this resolution, I will keep the ways of God. But I think that also leads us to a second resolution. 
And this is found in the next verse, verse 22. And David, maybe, maybe kind of the middle verse of the whole psalm, if, if this is one climactic verse that kind of brings everything together, it's verse 22 in this resolution, I follow the word of God. Not just I keep the ways of God, but I do that by following the word of God. Look at verse 22. For all of God's ordinances were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I love that little phrase in verse 22. They were before me. How do you live a life following God? How do you do that? You do that by putting the word of God before you every single day. By putting the word of God before you every single day. David in Psalm 119 put it like this in verse 165. Those who love your law have great peace and nothing causes them to stumble. I love that. The, those who love the law of God, they have great peace. People in our world are hungry for peace, but they don't know where to find it. But we have the word of God, and those who live by the word of God are those who live lives of integrity. You're in Psalm 18. Let your eyes skip maybe on the other column, Psalm 16. Look at what David says in verse 8. I think this is just kind of a real practical way that you can say, I will follow the word of God. Look at Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord continually before me. I love that. In that great messianic psalm, David is saying, it's like I've put the Lord right in front of me. It's like all that I do, like a, like, like a, like a compass that is just sort of pointing. We want to point our lives to the Lord, to follow him and his word in all that we do. Maybe you've heard the words of John Bunyan when Bunyan said, this book will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. And such a, such a helpful, simple little way to think about it, that our lives would be lives of integrity, where we would say that first resolution, I keep the ways of God. And then the second resolution, I follow the word of God. But let me give you a third resolution. Here's what David brings out in verse 23, back to our psalm. Psalm 18, verse 23. If we're going to do all this positively, there's also a putting off that we must do. And that's I flee from wickedness against God. It's one thing to say, yeah, 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 I'll do this, but there's also the negative. If we're going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to make no provision for the flesh. I flee from wickedness against God. Look at verse 23. I was also blameless with him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. I was blameless. Here's our, here's our word. Complete. Well-rounded blameless. And notice this little phrase, not just before the eyes of God, but here's the great connection with God. Do you see that in your Bible? I was blameless, verse 23, with him. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. You need the Lord and you need his strength. Go with me in your Bible to Proverbs 11. Let me show you Proverbs 11, how Solomon is discipling his son and he's going to give him wisdom along the same lines in Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11, verse 3. Kind of, a, kind of a good life verse for us on this topic of integrity. Proverbs 11, 3. The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. I mean, do you see? It's, it's kind of like you're, you'll either be preserved or you will be destroyed. You'll either be guided by God, or you'll be destroyed under the judgment of God. We want to live lives of integrity, Proverbs 11, 3. You're there. In Proverbs 11, just look back to Proverbs 10, verse 9. Lest anybody think that they could live a life where God does not see 
the hidden and unseen parts of our life. Proverbs 10, 9 tells the truth. He who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will be found out. Nothing can be hidden from God, but no one can ever hide from God. We must bear in mind the importance of this resolve. I will flee from all wickedness. Back to our psalm, Psalm 18. I think it's so helpful for us to remember how David has said, the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. Not, not that I'm righteous in and of myself. Not that I'm perfect in my own doing. Not that I'm accepted by God by my own merit. But only by Christ, of course, positionally are we accepted. But David says, my conduct is right. My conduct is complete. My conduct is a life of integrity. I think Jesus can be your pattern, right? Think of the, the trials of Christ. In Matthew chapter 26, when, when the Jewish people were bringing false witnesses again and again and again, and, and they were bringing their false testimonies against Jesus, and yet, I love this, even in the next phrase, Matthew 26, with all the many false witnesses, they could not find any witness against him. They couldn't find any evidence against him because his life was clean. The life of our Savior is a life of blamelessness. So you get it. You, you understand this. You understand the need for integrity for men and women in relationship and marriage, parenting, grandparenting and school in academic excellence, in Christian ministry, in discipleship, purity. We could go through all of these things. You get it. But let me see if I can apply it a little bit here in this portion of the study together. I think if we're going to understand integrity, we have to understand that a man of integrity is a hater of iniquity. Never forget that. A man of integrity is going to be a hater of iniquity. A man or a woman of God who's going to live a life of integrity must wake, make war with his integrity. A secret sin is a, is a murderer of integrity. So you, well, what do you do? Well, in your life and my life, we must, we must resolve and determine to destroy sin, to deal harshly with our sin. It's like whatever that sin is in my life and your life, what, what, whatever that sin is in your life, it's like we want to find it, we want to hang it up by the neck, and we want to slay it. We want to kill it. We want to strangle it. We want to strike it. We want to starve that sin. Spurgeon was writing about integrity, of course, in a way that only Spurgeon could word things. And he said, you got to expose your sin, identify your sin, have no mercy with your sin. Spurgeon said, do not fire at a sin indiscriminately, but if you have one sin that is more in you than another sin, Spurgeon said, you need to drag out that sin from the crowd, and you need to say to that sin, you must die. And I will hang you up in the face of the sun, and then you must dry out your sin, and you must kill your sin, and make war with your sin, Spurgeon said. That's kind of a picturesque description of making war with our sin. Why? Because a man of integrity is a hater of iniquity. And it all comes back to the heart. It all comes back to our psalm, Psalm 18, 23. I was blameless before the Lord. Lord, you've saved me. You've changed me. You've washed me all by grace. How could I now live in that for which my Savior died? How could I tickle the sin which crushed my Savior on the cross? Holiness has its home in your heart. And this is integrity. It's kind of like your heart is the steering wheel in your life. It's going to determine the direction of where you go. And holiness and integrity all begins on the inside in our heart. One pastor was talking about integrity. 
And he said integrity is completeness or wholeness in your life. What do you mean? He said you have integrity. If you complete a job, however small that job might be, even when no one is looking. Certainly applicable in a Bible college setting. He said you have integrity if you keep your word even when no one checks up on you. He said you have integrity if you keep your promises and people understand that you're a man or a woman of truth. You're a man of integrity, which means you have an absence of duplicity. You're, there's no hypocrisy. There's no two-faced side of you. You're a person of integrity if you do what you say, what you declare. You'll be the best that you can be for the reputation of the gospel and the glory of God. But, but integrity is more than just kind of deeds out there. It also includes financial accountability, personal reliability, purity, private purity. Someone who doesn't manipulate others or seek to control others. Not prone to arrogance or self-praise. I think integrity is even marked by inviting inviting accountability show me in my life examine my life is, is there anything in me that you see that is off balance or anything that is that is ungodly or anything that is impure anything that i'm blinded to any way that my pride is coming out invite that i, I welcome that integrity is sound it's solid it's complete it's whole with nothing to hide nothing to hide in Psalm 18, David is on the run for his life, and Saul has been chasing David, the anointed king, and, and David is saying, oh, I love you, O Lord. You're my rock. I call out to you. You're my deliverer. And he acknowledges in the middle of this great song, God, I, I live a life of integrity. I'm not, I'm not perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to have a pain-free life. But it means that you can say before the Lord, Lord, I, I want to be blameless. I want to be rewarded according to my righteousness. Again, not your position before God. That's done for Christ. This is right conduct. This is godly obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a true believer. You know, just for, for, for all of us here in this room, so, so what do you do? If there's that one sin that comes to mind or that temptation that keeps coming to mind that you battle and you often fall prey to, that, that one situation, that one circumstance, that one thing that comes into your mind and your heart when you think about integrity and it's plaguing you, what do you do? Number one, confess it. Confess it. Before God, your Father, who sees it, he knows it, nothing can be hidden. Not just confess it, I think number two, resolve. Resolve by the grace of God to set the word of God before you. Just like David with these three resolutions right here in our psalm. To keep the ways of God, to follow the word of God, and to flee from wickedness. Third, Christian, can I just remind you to depend confess resolve but third depend on the spirit because you can't do it on your own you and i are helpless on our own we need to depend upon the power of the spirit and the power of the word and fourth christian you have to cling to christ you have to cling to christ because going to heaven is not about your performance it's about clinging by faith to the perfect finished sufficient work of Christ. It was a number of years ago that with our church family, I preached a sermon on how to die well. You ever wonder, how do I die well? I, mean, I don't want to sort of wither away at the end of my life and be sort of this grumpy, complaining, ungodly, worldly guy. How do I end well? 
how do I die well? And so it's kind of more of a personal thing. I wanted to study how to die well. And quite, quite simply, at, at the end of your life, if you want to die well, here's the answer. You need to live well. Because no one will ever die well in the Lord if they do not live well in the Lord. Dying well means that you finish well. And to finish well means that you persevere well, clinging to Christ and His Word and His truth. I pray that it would be true for you and true for me that we would be men and women who are blameless. Men and women who are men and women of integrity. Men and women of truth. Men and women of character. This is not a, this is not a, a rebuke, it's a reminder because of the dangerous days in which we live that we would at the end of our life say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me and to all who have loved his appearing. You know, it was the cold winter months of the year 1688 when John Bunyan was traveling in the cold and he caught a fever which would take his life. And his final words, when he had some close friends that had gathered around him, the fever became very evident that he, his life was going to end. And his final words were, I go to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will no doubt, through the work of the Son, he will receive me, though I am a sinner. And he will receive me where I hope to meet Christ in glory and to sing the new song and to remain everlastingly happy. And then right as he took a few more breaths before he died, he said, my greatest desire is to depart and be with Christ. And then he raised his hands up to heaven and he said, take me, Lord, for now I come home to thee. What, what a simple and yet a great example of a life well lived. Dying well in the Lord because he lived well in the Lord. Make Bunyan's confidence be your confidence as well, that we would live lives of integrity for the glory of God. Father, thank you for your word and the time together this morning. Thank you for Brooks Bible College. Thank you for every single student here. And Father, we pray that you would convict us by the loving work of the Spirit, that you would remind us of the secure position that we have in Christ, and that you would help us to follow you and set the word of God before us each day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.